The following program will make you want to grow things and experience new and wonderful dreams about your plants, garden, and garden design. Listener participation is always strongly advised. And welcome to Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board, dial 905-725-1907. Toll free anywhere in North America, 1-866-905-7325. Worldwide, 1-866-656-5477. Send us an email right now. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. And now, ladies and gentlemen, right to your hosts of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Hello and welcome everyone to Down the Garden Path where each week we discuss down-to-earth tips and advice for your plants, gardens, and landscapes. As landscape designers and gardeners, we think it is important and possible to have great gardens that are low maintenance, and we want to help you make it happen. I'm Joanne Shaw, landscape designer and owner of Down-to-Earth Landscape Design. I've been designing beautiful landscapes for homeowners east of Toronto for over a decade. With me across the city is uh, Matthew, and across Zoom is uh, my co-host, Matthew Dressing. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Joanne, from way over here. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am Matthew Dressing, horticulturist and landscape designer and owner of Natural Affinity Designs. Natural Affinity is a landscape design and garden maintenance firm servicing Toronto and the Eastern GTA. Joanne and I enjoy hosting Down the Garden Path each week, bringing you interesting, relevant, and helpful topics to help you achieve a great garden. We learn right along with you from each other, from our research, and from the guests that join us here on the show. As always, we welcome your questions via social media, emails, or phone calls. That's right. And we want to thank you for joining us here on the live version of Down the Garden Path. And to remind you that you can always check out past shows of Down the Garden Path on your favorite podcast app. We'll release the show later this week. And you can find all of our uh, past two and a half years of content, right? Lots of content on there. Um, And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe so that you'll be notified of the new content. And please leave us a like, share, or even a comment. We really appreciate that, don't we? We do indeed. We love to hear from you guys. We love it. We love it. We love it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So in our second show for the month of May. Yes. Um, yeah, it's the second month of the month of show. And, you know, every month we are doing a theme this year. Or theme this year, yeah. And uh, this month's theme is gardening beyond the basics. From creating low-maintenance gardens and straw bale gardens. Uh, to creating unusual co- container combinations and discovering new and wonderful plants for your landscapes. Uh, tonight, we're going to continue our month-long discussion when we're going to talk about unique uh, container combos and uh, using unusual plants in containers. That's right. Just thinking outside the annuals, right? Like, you know, everybody can go and get some geraniums. Like, we want to we wanna step it up with our gardening beyond the basics. So we won't be talking about geraniums or begonias unless, of course, we have a lovely listener question. 
<laughs> That's right. And if you've got questions or you want to join the conversation or perhaps you have a cool container combo or question uh, yourself, you can write us uh, now at instudio101 at gmail.com. That's right. That's right. So I want to start off. I, there was a funny meme on that uh, because the weather this weekend was just like unbelievable, oh. right? And even today. So there was a funny meme uh, that I, I just realized where this month is called May. It may rain, it may snow, it may be 70 degrees, and it may be 20 degrees, and it may be 20 degrees. So I thought that was perfect. Isn't that hilarious? That's hilarious. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. So my neighbor's, uh, my neighbor's uh, granddaughter lives just north of the city, and they literally made a snowman this morning. <gasps> really? Yeah. Where, how far north of the city? Uh, Cal- Caledon. Wow. Here in Caledon, yeah. So if we shout out to any listeners that might be north of the city, how much snow, how long did it last? Um, we didn't get any snow here in Pickering. I didn't get any snow. Did you? Today, no. Uh, but over the weekend, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was working out in the snow. Yeah. yeah so tell us. Um, we always start off our show with... Uh, you know, kind of what's happening at the garden center. And uh, so lots of this garden center is open Friday. You weren't expecting that. I know last time we talked last week, you were thinking they would open Monday, but they opened Friday, or Friday right? So yeah, was did. it crazy? Was you, Were you guys ready? We, we uh, surprisingly, yes. We, we had a lot of stuff in. Um, we were a little outside of what we normally looked like just because we're doing online orders and phone picking. So we just kind of were receiving and using the sales floor just as kind of a warehouse. So, um, you know what, the garden center crew, they were amazing. They changed everything back out to the way it was supposed to be, got stuff out on benches, took care of plants, received a bunch of stuff. And in those two days, we, I wouldn't say we were at a hundred percent. Um, we're kind of what we would look like in April where, you know, stuff is still coming in and, but yeah, but for sure stuff's out on benches, but not the full selections quite there, but we were definitely ready and people were, were streaming in. We didn't think it was going to be Friday. Uh, so we put out our arrows and our signs and, you know, came up with a floor plan, uh, on the Thursday and then Friday we hit the ground running and there were a lot and lots of people who who came out there were people who were waiting up to an hour just to get in uh, because we're only letting so many people within uh, the garden center we don't have as big of aisles as you know a a walmart main aisle might be right so we kind of had to you know put some benches out and direct traffic and let people come in only so many at a time but they were in and they were buying and they were shopping and lots of questions Uh, it was a good day and it kind of felt save the masks and the gloves and the hand sanitizing and all the COVID procedures. It kind of felt like we were pretty much back to normal or we were starting Uh, to have like a spring again in the garden center, which was nice. Nice. Except for the the fact that it was freezing, but aside from that. (laughs) The Friday wasn't bad. And then it was just, it's a whole weekend just turned into, I have pictures on my phone I, I wanted to post. Uh, we had like two centimeters of snow and the shrubs had inches of snow, like just little clumps of it all over the place. And it was like, mm. is it fall? Like, is it September? Yeah. Oh, I couldn't believe it, but we worked through it. We got everything out and uh, things are looking good again. Oh, well, that is good. And well, that saved you from what, all the shrubs got all that water from the snow. <laughs> right? Yeah, I think. They did get a little bit melted in there for sure. We do have some water uh, to still do uh, to catch up on just because of the the wind. It's just so desiccating where we are. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, just some things that have come in and we put out, we have to kind of go back and do a little bit of catch up. But yeah. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Now, were people, like, I'm sure people were so happy to be there. Were they, like, everybody kind of following procedures or and they kind of, that kind of thing? Yeah, for the most part, it was a very mixed bag. Um, a lot of people, I would probably say 60 to 70% of people were still not wearing masks or any PPP or PPE of their own. So no gloves, no masks or anything like that. But there was a good group of people who were. 
Um, and everyone pretty much kept their distance. It's kind of tough in the garden center too, with a lot of people bringing in their phones and they're like, Oh, I've got this space or can you identify this? And you, you oh. know, your arm's only a foot and a bit long. So it's like, how do you really see it outside in the nursery or so there were some, a little bit of pushing the boundaries for distancing, but for the most part, everybody did. Not everybody was following the arrows and some people were going backwards or, you know, they're scooching beside someone and turning away so that they're not breathing on them. But for the most part, everybody was good. Everybody hand sanitized as they came in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Everyone but was you, pretty yeah, good. Yeah. You were requesting that everybody come with a mask, right? We, I don't think we were. Oh, um, Okay. We, I don't think we were. I, I think it was recommended in, in one of the e-blasts that we did. Uh, but, yeah, just for your own safety. But we are, as staff, we're all recommended. We all have to have um, some sort of glove on, whether there are work gloves or plastic gloves, um, and disinfect that regularly. And then uh, we also have to have masks on at all times uh, as okay. best we can. In the nursery, being out out in the nursery part of things, uh, there were times where I was all by myself or, you know, it was snowing and there was no one around. I had mine down. But on the windy weekend, it was it was almost like a little scarf keeping my face. Yeah. Down. So yeah. it was nice to have. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. And then did it get better? Like, so Friday was super busy. It was How was Saturday and Sunday? Yeah, Saturday was still steady. Um, a few less people were there. Um, and then Sunday being Mother's Day, it was kind of a mixed group. There were people out getting Mother's Day presents. Yeah. And uh, just few, I think fewer people. We, we still suspect that some people just aren't coming in because they are afraid of that it's the first time that they're open. There's going to be a lot of people. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And so that decreased, but then the weather turned. And I think that that definitely lowered our numbers for Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, for sure. And I think that makes sense. That, and especially since the weather wasn't great, so it wasn't like you could, whatever you bought, you could put out or you could plant, right? Um, so I think that that's, a, you know, a huge segment. So leading up to this weekend and, and things, hopefully, hopefully, I know the weather's still really not going to warm up here in Ontario. Um, I know, uh, wherever, oh, no, we have listeners from all over the world. So, uh, so that's just a little story about how, um, you know, during this pandemic, the nursery garden centers have not been, um, uh, essential up until this point, and they were given the go-ahead, I think, on Wednesday that they could open on Friday, so not right. a ton of notice, but they've been really advocating, and, and uh, nurseries, you know, make their money in, in a short window uh, of weeks, so it's great that they were able to open up. Yeah, we really make all the money uh, plus or minus six weeks of the May 2-4 weekend, and then we get a little bit extra depending on how early the spring might be or a little less depending on how late the spring is. Um, yeah. So if we didn't open now, we would be, we would be in trouble for sure. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. So that is good. So, and did you find where people buying nursery, nursery plants and stuff? You know what? It's really funny. Very few people, we had some good nursery sales, but very few, few people were out with the trees and the shrubs. They were definitely inside with the annuals the perennials yeah. and the, the vegetables. Um, and then I think we're going to say, we're talking about uh, containers and all that stuff, putting that stuff outside. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah. More, more color. I think everyone needed that, that colorful flower hit and that plant to bloom and brighten everybody's day for sure. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And I think cause people, because of the weather, people aren't really like tearing up their gardens or, do, you know, they're certainly planning. I, I have to say I am busy. I'm getting lots of calls uh, for designs. And uh, so I think people are thinking about it, but I think the weather just hasn't been conducive to people wanting to do um, to do much as far as trees and shrubs go. And also the fact that they haven't been able to look at them, you know, that it's it's just been so recent. So, so I think yeah. that, I think that will come. And I think you, you might find, I know you said that six weeks around, um, the May long weekend, but I think that might, because of everything going on, especially the weather, I think that might get extended beyond, uh, you know, the, the May long weekend for a change. I think so too. I, I think it'll, it'll be pushed out a little further. Uh, we're going to have a couple or a few weeks before uh, the online and the, the pickup, the, 
pick up helping a bit. Uh, and then, yeah, mm-hmm. lo- later through the year uh, or into June and early July, we'll see a little bit more where we don't normally. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think it'll, I think it'll be kind of dragged out a little bit as, as things start changing. So, so that's good. And the gift wear where that, I know shared in the nursery that you work at does a great job with the gift wear and the patio furniture and that type of stuff. Was that kind of ready to go or did you focus on the plants? Uh, no, it was, yeah, it was all ready to go. Yeah. We were all pretty much ready to go and just limiting people in uh, the store as well. Just how okay. many people were or weren't allowed in there. Because, it's, again, it's a confined space. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. So that's what's happening in the garden center. That's right. That's right. So in the garden center, um, you know, one of the main things a lot of people like to do is container gardening and filling those containers and putting things out in a bit to kind of segue into our topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So this week... We're going to talk about, uh, yeah, the different uh, container combinations and unusual things that you can and cannot do with containers or do some things that you don't normally think you would be able to do Mm -hmm. with with containers. That's right. So uh, where would we like to start? Maybe just off? Well, let's, I think we, regardless of what we put in them, yeah, I think let's give some tips on what we can, because I think that's a big challenge for people in the containers is that things don't, don't thrive because what, you know, because, and we know it's because of what they put in the pot and the size of the pot. So let's start off with our recommended recommendations. What do you think? Um, so just sure. start with the basics and then we'll go to some unique, uh, unique things and out of the box thinking as far as our containers go. How about that? Yeah, we'll ramp up from there. Yeah, that's okay. It's one of the questions I know I get all the time is what kind of soil goes in into a container. So if we start with soils and then kind of going into containers, um, maybe basically a lot of the things is it's going to come down to a potting mix. It's going to be a lighter weight mix. One of the reasons is that it's designed to hold the water. It's designed to drain, uh, but it's also very lightweight. Because depending on the container that you purchase, if you're buying something that's clay or you're buying something that's uh, larger and ceramic, that's going to just add to the weight. Another thing that we, a lot of us do is we're putting our annuals or uh, other plants, tropical things, mostly annuals, um, that are in there. And they're not native to our types of soil. So as we move around the world, you know, the soil changes. So a lot of the long blooming uh, tropical annually type things tend to have a little bit of a, a looser or a more organic or more well-drained lighter soil than we, at least that we do here in Ontario. We've got our crazy clay uh, loam, so it can be very hard to work with and sometimes heavy. So imagining putting a heavier soil, like a triple mix, into your pot, you're going to add a lot of density and a lot of weight um, and sometimes those soils are just too heavy for some of the, the annuals and the other plant material that you put in there. So starting with a nice and lightweight um, organic based potting soil is, is what is basically designed and what's recommended for putting them in there. Okay. And I've heard of some people kind of making their own like versus buying the bagged stuff. Yeah, and you can definitely make your own. You can buy just like the peat moss. You can buy the bulk of vermiculite. You can buy the perlite, uh, and you can buy the humus and the other components and mix them all together, depending on on what you want to do. For sure. So it's definitely easy to do. Uh, and there's a lot of different formulas and recommendations and things mm-hmm. out there on in out there in the world and on on the web for sure. Yeah, online for sure. For yeah, sure. and even. Even greenhouses and growers, when they're growing those potted plants, uh, they have their own mixes depending on what they're growing and as they're potting things up. So there's not necessarily a, a single standard. There's a few different mixes that are out there. Okay. Um, one of the ones, one of the ways that we like to recommend, one of the tips that you can do to in, increase the longevity of of your potted annuals or other plant material should just say plant material, um, is adding a layer of compost mm. into the bottom of all your containers. So if you imagine we've got this peat moss, 
uh, base potting mix, if that's what you start with, uh, or if you mix your own, usually the base is peat moss. Uh, what happens is as those plants grow up, those fibrous root systems fill all that soil and all that space. Uh, they need more water, they need, uh, they're competing, they need more food. But what's nice is that if you layer it with two to four or six inches, depending on the size of your container, to um, on the bottom of your container, as we get to the midsummer, as things get big and they start to get stressed, they burrow into a nice, rich, uh, organic layer of compost that really revitalizes them. It's not going to be like a synthetic fertilizer. It's going to be just a nice, rich, organic feed that's going to rejuvenate them and give them a nice, long, sustained feed. Uh, so that's one of the tips and tricks that I, I do personally with my uh, window boxes. I like to put okay. a little layer and then I'll put in, in my normal potting mix. Sometimes okay. as well, I will just also mix uh, like a nine to one or, you know, 60% to 40%. I'll mix my potting mix with just a nice, light, fluffy compost as well. It adds okay. a little bit of weight to my containers. But as long as you don't have something really like a heavy, heavy compost, like an ocean-based compost or a sea compost, they tend to be a little heavier than something like a forest-based compost or uh, even a sheep and cow manure can be a little heavier too. Uh, that I like to mix those up. That keeps it nice and light, but they also just start with a nice burst of food that's not synthetic that you have to worry about watering all the time. They've always got some added moisture retention and some good feeding going on. Okay. Okay. I would say my biggest tip and, and the one thing that I think I see a lot of uh, people do wrong is pot size. So I do want to tell people that, you know, go big or go home when it comes to the pot size. I think, um, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people will buy like the 10 inch, let's say the 10 inch this is one of my secrets is to buy the 10 inch uh, big pot of annuals, but then they'll put it in a, a, a like a, only a 12 inch pot. You know, um, so they'll take it out of the 10 inch hanging basket and which it's all root bound and very little soil left in there. And then they put it in a 12 inch pot on the ground, you know, thinking that it, it's going to really grow. But it would do so much better if you put it in a bigger 14 or 16 inch pot. And, you know, I think you can add so much more that the goal is to really have room for those roots to grow. And uh, so I do want to encourage people to, you know, and I know those, the means the pots get heavier and harder to move around, that type of thing. But I think it, you know, especially when you add the compost at the bottom, like you said, um, you can really have a lot more impact with the, with the pot if you, if you choose a, a larger pot. And there's so much selection now. You can get bigger ones that are lighter, right? And you can get the little rollers on them, which we'll talk a little bit about. So there's some, there's some great options uh, out there, some that will stay out over the winter, right? That you don't have to worry about putting away. Yeah, exactly. Just like you said, there's so many different options. And as you're saying, you're very right. Putting it something in a bigger container, you're going to get that bigger impact. And then your plants are going to be much happier as well, being able to grow and spread out uh, as well into a little bit more soil. And I, it makes me think about last week's show, how our number one tip or your number one tip for our listeners was making the beds bigger right? How okay. counterintuitive that is, uh, but just along those lines. So you're going to allow, allow things to spread out, more root zone to fill. They're going to be able to uh, stay healthier and demand a little less in some of those dog days uh, of the summer. That's yeah. right. That's right. You know, the watering is going to last, the fertilizer is going to last. The, right. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as, and also just the variety of plants you can put in and when we're going to get to the plant part for all those plant, plant people, but we thought we would start off with uh, some <laughs> tips and tricks to get you started. Um, cause, cause right now, if you haven't bought your plants yet because of the weather, um, you can get started on that, right? You can get the soil mixtures. You can look for your containers, that type of thing. I know we have a few that we need to like dump out last year's, you know, uh, potting mix out of, um still because the weather hasn't really been conducive to do that so uh so yeah yeah and that's where i am too i haven't gotten any of mine ready yet yeah <laughs> it's just been so cold yeah. so yeah uh, look at your soil um adding some compost just naturally enriching it it takes away some of that maintenance and some of that feeding that you have to do it's going to give those plants a nice big burst when it comes to being hot and crazy uh and then checking with the right containers i go a little bit bigger uh, for those annuals and those mixed planters and things that you might want to 
uh, put together as a combination, which we're going to talk about and hopefully inspire you to uh, choose a few new things. That's right. Uh, and then uh, and last, I think just I didn't really maybe elaborate on your point, but yeah, definitely take a look. There's lots of different containers that are large and very lightweight uh, for your container. And if you you're worried about a large container and getting the weight, a lot of people are like, well, do I have to put all that space with soil? You mm. do want to put enough soil. But if you have a, an exceptionally, like if you have like a large columnar, a very tall looking planter, you can put other things in there, like a bag of stones at the bottom to weight it down, because then that something becomes top heavy. But you could also use things like uh, recycled pots. If you have old plant pots, you can stack them and break them and fill them in and create enough of a layer that the soil won't sink all the way through. A lot of those pots have holes in them or some of the smaller pots we have. Uh, some different size holes, right? Soil doesn't pour out and break through those. So you can make a little layer of some lighter weight material on top of something like your stone to take up a little bit of that volume. But make sure you do leave enough volume that your roots are going to spread out, things are going to fill in, and just to reduce your maintenance for it. But that's another one of those questions we always get with those super big containers. Yeah, that's true. Because, yeah, as much as I say go big or go home, that there are some that are exceptionally big deep you know so we want the width yeah. you know but you you know that the house plants you know or the plants aren't going to get to that bottom two feet you know on a four foot uh high high container kind of thing so uh so yeah so that's yeah. a good good point uh for sure for sure yeah so. just as we start to move on i just want to shout out to alice who's written in uh, she says, hello, Joanne and Matthew. So very glad to hear uh, that the Garden Center is starting to get back to some type of normalcy. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Sorry. And thank you for the show. And thank you for writing it out. Yeah, definitely. In. Definitely. Thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited about this topic because I think that's one this is one area where I, I, every year I try to do something different in my containers. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm excited. Um, so I hope uh, our listeners understand, um, you know, the compost is a good step, the, the, the good gardening soil, good potting mix and a good sized pot. Right. That is the, your starting recipe for uh, fantastic containers. That's right. That's so that right. I, I kind of alluded to the one tip. I don't know if a lot of people do that, but sometimes when you want to, if you do have a big pot and you want to, you don't want to buy, let's say the annuals, in, even though we're not going to talk a lot about annuals, you don't want to buy them in um, cell packs necessarily and just wait for them to fill in. There's some people that don't mind doing that. But I think the one thing about containers and why people are so keen to get the garden center to get them is because they want instant, right? They want instant impact. So starting and, you know, getting those 10 inch or 12 inch um, hanging baskets and then taking the annuals out of them and putting them into a larger or larger container. Do you find that that is, I know that's something I've often done. Has, has that something you think is a common trick? Yeah, definitely. A lot of people just, they have their container size um, or a couple containers and they'll get the mixed baskets, hanging baskets or just a single hanging basket and they just either drop it right in or like you say, they'll they'll put it bigger or spread them apart mm -hmm. um, Some with some of those bigger, larger, mature potted uh, bedding plants and go instant gratification. Mm -hmm. so certainly. Yeah, so I think that's a good trick to do. Um, I yeah. think what you need to remember that those, especially the 10 inch pots, uh, um, there's not a lot of, they've been growing in those pots for a long time, right? There's a, not a lot yeah. of soil and not a lot of nutrients left in there. So I know, um, especially if you leave it in those 10 inch pots and hang them or, or just leave them in the 10 inch pot, cut off the hangers and put them in another container. And then by end of June, you're wondering why it's not looking great. Um, that's why, I mean, there's not a lot in there. So uh, I think if you are buying a container that you don't want to, you know, you don't want to do a lot to it, um, then start thinking about getting more, a bigger one, like buy, you know, I know it's more money, but I think it's going to get you through the whole season. So buying a 14 inch or a 16 inch pot hanging basket and those containers, you know, have a little bit more space for those plants to grow a little bit more soil and nutrients still left, left in the pot. There really isn't much left in a, in a 10 inch pot. And if you don't believe us, you can, you know, try to take one out and really examine the roots and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just reality. 
just going to say that. It just, it just go to your garden center and any of the annuals or any of the perennials, just flip them over. They're already next to root bound. Um, yeah. They've been just in there being grown for so long. So, yes, excellent. Um, Chris has just written in. Can I use the soil from last year's pot to mix mm. in new plants this year? Mm, um, good question. Right. So like you were saying, too, you have to yet to empty your pots. So yes and no. Uh, no in the way that you want fresh new soil. You need some good soil because the plants from last year, Chris, have sucked all the nutrients and have, have eaten a lot of what was in that soil. Plus um, winter, plus spring, like, yes. Right. And now you've got water, you've got weather, and it is a living thing. The soil is as that peat base is breaking down as it goes. Um, so which releases a little bit of nutrients, the structure is gone. And, and, you know, the plants from last year combined with that is just growing it away. So if you add, I like to do it a little bit too. I, I hate to throw out stuff. And again, I'm in an apartment. So the amount of soil that I have to bring up and downstairs can uh, get a little crazy. So I try to do it by adding it to, again, mixing it with a little bit of compost um, again, and just using that compost to revitalize some of the soil, uh, give a little bit more structure, but then again, it's, got, it's alive, it's got microorganisms that will continue to break it down and feed it and, and revitalize a little bit of the structure. Okay. I wouldn't go like full out. I've never used all the soil that I had last year because literally it just turns to dust. There's nothing there for it to grow okay. in and you water it and it just pulls away. And once it dries out, the peat's hydrophobic anyways. So it just washes away. So yes, and no, oh, okay. if you want to mix a little bit of it in, but I would recommend putting it out into your garden uh, where nature can, can finish breaking it down and revitalize it and take it back into the, into the system. Okay, a, a and cycle. that's what I was going to say. So if you don't want to throw it away, um, yeah. and it's it's just, it's a lot of work to reuse it for, you know, mid, midway, mid, mid kind of success, I, you know, you can dump it into your, you know, I know it's clumpy, and it's got like hard as a rock, and it's got root bound <laughs> and stuff. But you can, you know, it's much easier, I think, to work with that and work that into an existing bed you know, in the back, you know, than it is to work it back into a container. Like, I think it's easier to make it useful in a, in a garden versus in a container. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that's me trying to like mix the two together, but I just, yeah, a gardener. Yeah. Right. For sure. Yeah. For yeah. sure. And there's no harm in that, right? The vermiculite that goes into the garden, like there's no, I think there's some people that are worried that because it's potting soil that it's going to then degrade um the yard soil or the garden soil but that's it's fine right yep yep um yeah the vermiculite and the perlite are just mineral based additives that they'll just vanish they'll become part of it and so you won't even know yeah okay so but that was a great fun. question yeah yeah thank you chris um another question is just popped in while we were answering chris's daredevil writes in Hi, does it actually matter for the health of the plant if I use a plastic or a clay pot? Is one, or sorry, are one any better? Is one any better than the other? I guess you're saying. Uh, and thank you. Um, good question. Um, yes and no. Um, the plastic <laughs> we say that, like, you say that all the time. <laughs> yes, and yeah, exactly. I try not to, I'm trying to break the science brain down. <laughs> Um, yes, in the way that the clay allows air to kind of and water to be porous. Clay is porous. So it'll allow water to be drawn out um, and air to kind of circulate and help drawing it out. Plastic, um, and because of air and water movement, it'll keep the root zone cooler. Whereas the plastic, can, especially if it's a darker plastic, can keep the heat in the root zone. And that can warm the soil up and can stress some things out sometimes, especially if you've got a, like a nursery pot or something like that. But overall, no, if you have plastic window boxes or just a plastic nursery gallon container like I have out on my balcony, it, it doesn't really adversely affect the plant. So there are some benefits and some downsides, but overall, it's not gonna kill your crop. 
Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I mean, and I think the benefits of the terracotta and uh, you know are are a few, but then I think the downside of is how fragile it is and how hard it is to store. Uh, you know right. what I mean? I, so I think you kind of have to balance that out. And I think that um, you know, just in our, especially it depends on where you live. So certainly, are, if you are in a more warmer client daredevil, uh, then you know terracotta is not an issue. But in our freeze thaw cycles, terracotta can be a huge issue. So I think the little bit of benefit it might give to a plant um, doesn't give a benefit to the gardener who's then got to you know be so careful with the with the pot. Yeah, definitely, and especially up here in the north, right? Yeah, our winters would pop that like a bubble if it's sitting damaged yeah. or soaked with water and it didn't dry out. So yeah, definitely, depending on where you are. If you're in California or Arizona. <laughs> yeah no don't worry don't worry yes yeah, so our lovely we love your west coast listeners we love that you love to listen to us commiserate about the bad weather when and rub it in and tell us that you're calling from uh, las vegas or uh, arizona <laughs> right uh and make us jealous of your weather but uh those are things that we have to deal with. So, so I'm excited yeah. about talking. Like I know our time is flying already. I'm excited to talk about some plants. So, what yeah. are some things? Well, I think people. I mean, we all know that. Like I said, we're not going to talk a ton about annuals. We're not going to talk about. You know, you know the begin begonias. We did talk about the hanging basket trick, so that's an option. Um, I think I, I think a lot of people want to do instant, and I think. If you want instant interest, if you want to strategically, there's some people that need some privacy and they want to strategically, they don't know what to do to how to get, you know, maybe some privacy on their deck or, or some privacy in a, in, a, in a spot. And I think sometimes you can do containers and you can put shrubs in containers. There are some really, again, this goes with getting a large shrub because if you go with a large pot, sorry, a large pot, if you go with a large pot, then you may even get two or three seasons. Uh, that that shrub may overwinter. It's not going to overwinter forever, but, you know, you're still farther ahead. Um, you got it. Because, you know, so if you're buying a $30 shrub, that's going to give you amazing impact. I know you're spending more than $30 on annuals. So, uh, so yeah, so some of my favorite um, gold lace elder um, even the what is the burgundy elder? It's gone and escaped my mind. Yeah, there was black beauty or laced up. Right. Black lace, all the three. That's of them. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those, you know, those are lovely and really unique looking shrub with some pop of color. And they'll do wonderful in a container. Um, Tiger's Eye Sumac, which I don't tend to like putting in a garden because I find it can be pretty aggressive and just like its sister, brother, cousin, the regular sumac. And and, and so I kind of recommend those. Don't go in the garden personally, uh, but they're so aggressive that they'll do well. And they kind of have a really unique, almost like palm tree kind of tropical look to them. So I think you could still do a large shrub and a large pot and then still have have something trailing you know you could still follow the. I don't know if everybody knows about the thriller filler and spiller when it comes to creating uh, impact in a container um I don't know if that's officially Paul Zamet's thing but uh, I will definitely credit to that's where I learned about thriller spiller and filler was <laughs> our uh, our famous Ontario uh, grown uh, Paul Zamet um so so yeah so do you have some shrubs some favorite shrubs you think would look good in a pot you oh, I put you I on the spot. Do. You totally put, put you on the spot, spot. and I'm like, totally good. Um, yes. <laughs> well, how about willow? Like, think of the more, like, I think I lean towards almost the more aggressive shrubs, right? Like willow. Yeah. Curly willow, that would be more aggressive. Um, you know, the elders, are, I wouldn't say the elders are aggressive. The sumac's aggressive. You know, so I think there's some really unique ones that you can... Um, you know, you can, uh, ornamental grasses, I think some people think of that because they get tall, but they don't get tall till late in the season. Yeah. So I, I, I think that's a really a waste, you know, necessarily, um, to, to consider that as far as height goes. Yeah. Yeah. As far as height goes, I would rather put something in there, um, something upright or something, something more interesting like uh pencil holly. 
or something like a cedar. And again, knowing that it's not going to live forever. But again, mm-hmm. watching that, especially when you go evergreen, watching what kind of container you have and what climate you're in. Because if you have something like that, it, they need water to the end of the season. And that can damage your container, be the amount that they need to have in the soil, because they're still drinking up water all the way until it starts to freeze or freeze. Right. So, um, yeah, the other thing I've liked is just some of the little um, standards. I like the little Vigilia standard. I think that's super cute. Um, I've liked, I've seen Bobo standards in some of the bigger Ooh, containers. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I've also seen just Bobo. Uh, that's probably one of my favorites. Uh, Bobo, just because it's that, you know, two to three feet tall. Uh, but with just some like ivies and some trailing, just tucked over or tucked under just a slightly larger container. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one of the containers I like to design with or, or that I like to see too is the bowl containers. Oh, so okay. Everyone kind of thinks of like the upright, it's, it's taller than it is wide. I like to see like the bowl sized containers with like a small shrub or, or like a larger sort of perennial or, or tropical in the middle and then kind of building it down and having it a little bit more 360. But anyway, okay. that's digress. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's a great tip. That's a great tip for sure. And I think um, that's cool to do small, small, um, uh, um, oh my gosh, just small standard trees. I even wondered about putting a burning bush. Uh, you know, there's some people that have, burning bush is lovely and, and people are very, um, you know, a lot of people want it, but a lot of people have rabbits. And it is like a rabbit delicacy. So I'm wondering if that could be a way to kind of have, you know, put the burning bush in a couple large pots and corners of your yard where, you know, it looks green. And and for for a shrub um, to leaf out in the spring, it is one of the first to leaf out. So it does have that advantage. Um, But the big advantage, of course, of it turning red definitely needs to be in the full sun. And, And that's something, too, a lot of people say, oh, anything I put, um burns or it's too hot that type of thing where maybe where burning bush would probably really love that and then in the fall go red so so i think that's a neat way to have something and then maybe you're made you've even made it rabbit proof (laughs) right yeah definitely no great tip um the burning bush standard also comes if you just have something that you'd like some green um, yeah. And then just have something more, something further down, like some perennials and some mixed tropicals, just to kind of give you a height and a, and a backdrop. Yeah. That's right. I also picture your burning bush, if using something like a burning bush um, in your containers. And I, I know I come to mind and some of our, our people or our garden center customers come to mind too, is just a container. What if you had a, a group of two or three containers where you had a nice burning bush and then something else a little bit color, more colorful and you have the pot and the green of the burning bush and the two of them together to kind of create a small layered container garden area. Absolutely. And, yeah. Right? Think about the um, like burning bush and the gold uh, lace elder. I mean, yeah. that would be a wonderful combo where you've got the green of the burning bush all year, the beautiful lacy yellow of the golden la- of the gold uh, lace elder. And then in the fall, when the red goes burgundy, you know, or the burning bush goes red, you've got, it looks like a different plant. So yeah, yeah. I think you can definitely have a lot of fun with shrubs. I think that's a, a cool thing to do, right? It's because there's a lot of, um, you know, even the maybe putting some of the barberries, you know, they're thorny and they're a little hard to work with, but they love it hot and dry. Um, whether you've got the lime yellow ones or the burgundy ones, they can really, you know, be a standout in a container as well. So so I think you could have a lot of fun, um, you know, thinking outside the annuals and looking at something like that. And it's a good size container and it's planted well. Uh, you know, you, you might even get a couple seasons out of it. So, um, so yeah. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. And of course you mentioned tropicals, so we can't, we obviously, (laughs) as much as we're not going to focus on annuals necessarily, there are some really cool tropical plants. I know I've had wonderful success last year over the moon success with my, uh, my white, I got a white flowering diplodenia and I got green and white variegated ivy and white, white um, spider plants. And they made amazing. It was so, so easy. And it, they made amazing containers outside my front yard. And I kept all, oh, the ivy did give it, give up the ghost, but I did keep my, um, 
diplodemia through the winter and I did keep my spider plant through the winter. So I'm, I'm thinking I may do it again. Um, so I'm excited. Uh, I was able to winter one of my diplodemia at home. I gave the other one. My mother-in-law has a very sunny condo window. So she kept the other cause I thought, okay, well, like we'll split the odds, uh, but they're mm-hmm. both doing great. So whether I can get them to flower, we'll see. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so what are, so diplodemia and mandevilla, which people kind of know them by both names but they are kind of more of a flowering more like a vine right you can even get them already on a started on a trellis yeah exactly and there's another way to do to get that height in your um your containers too right is using something like a tropical or an annual vine to grow up and and create some height as well uh, yeah. but i love using the cordelin series um of plants so it's a big leafy it comes in uh, what was the i forget what the the other common name is, but the cordelins, uh, very big, leafy, kind of layered, rich, dark, almost like purple blacks, so and then edged with bright reds and pinks. Uh, and then there's ones that are green, reds, and whites all together. But they make a great thriller, that center of your container. Uh, okay. Other perennials and other things around as well. Okay. Like palms, or like, would it be like, because there's, then there's palm trees or palm well, not? Or- Palm, palm tree in the sense of the house plant palms, right? And yeah. banana, banana, banana plant. Are they banana plants or banana palms? What are they? Yeah, they're technically, yeah, there are bananas. Yeah, just like okay. bananas, true bananas. Yep. Yeah, I they are shockingly, <laughs> yeah, they are shockingly tall for the small size pot. Their roots, right? They're, they kind of will surprise you that their pot, that the, the roots are in, are, is actually pretty small in comparison to the scale. So, which is good because then you can still fit them in another larger container. And that's another one. I know I use that uh, for the last couple of years as privacy as well. So, you can put those in in a pot uh, on a deck, as long as it's not windy, because they will be blowing over a little bit. Um, I think I had to do a bungee cord to keep it from blowing over. Um, but uh, the world is the world is away, I guess. Um, but yeah, if you wanted some screening, I know um, we may have some listeners that are like you and, and condos or apartments and that want to still have something really interesting out on the balcony. Um, so yeah, so looking at tall um, things like tall house you know, plants, you know, big things like uh, like that, and then adding something to the maybe to the base or maybe trailing uh, over as well. And it's really doable, isn't it? Yeah, it's very easy and very doable for sure. Before we move on, I think we have a couple questions. Excellent. Uh, Erica writes in, hello, fantastic tips tonight. Uh, do those hydrometers or watering meters really work uh, to put in my pots, or should I just use the old finger to tell uh, when I need water? Thanks. Oh, great question, Erica. And do you have a do you have a spin on it before I go? No, yeah. you go for okay. it. Um, yes, they work, but there are different grades, Erica. So there are just the cheapy ten dollar dollar store garden center easy ones to do. You don't want to leave the probe in the soil all the time because you can get it just kind of misreads it breaks it down and damages it there's some 60 dollar ones that are, are really amazing and accurate really reusable just keeping the batteries going and going you can use the fingertip um and i'm going to take you one more on that one but note that when you put your finger only so far down the top of the soil is always going to dry out to wind and air and sun so you might get a false reading where down below it still might be really wet depending on mm. how deep your container is and by constantly watering by just what you see on top or where your finger goes down to you might be adding more water lower down where it doesn't need more water and drowning things so what i like to do is use a wooden cooking spoon and i put Mm. the spoon in my hand and i insert the very long handle and leave it for two to five minutes and being wood the water will be absorbed into the wood and you can kind of get layers and you can kind of see where the, the, how far the water is down. So if you've got bigger containers, the spoon will go further down after a couple of minutes and layer or mark with water and some mucky soil when you pull it out. You can see how much water you do or don't need to, to add to it. Oh, that's cool. a great trip. And you can do that even in uh, if you're planting a new tree in the ground, yeah. right? And you're For not sure. sure you're not sure if the water is getting all the way down. Um, so that is a good trick. But yeah, a good old wooden spoon. 
uh, I think is a great idea. Excellent. Mm. Well, thank you for that great question. Yeah, thank you very much, Erica. And one other question. Uh, oh, Greg has written in. Uh, I'm loving all the discussion tonight, except da, 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 da. Uh, when will it get warm here in southern Ontario? Yeah. Matt, does the garden center sell anything to help uh, the sun come out oh, out more? <laughs> Love you folks. Oh, thank you, Greg. Yeah, I, I have been praying. I don't know. Uh, we don't have anything really. I was hoping and looking for some bigger fans to put into the sky, but uh, no, we've got nothing to move the weather. Someone's got to find the big thermostat and, and turn yeah, it Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's Mother Nature trying to keep us in the house, you know, for to get us through to get us through this uh, situation. So, uh, so yeah. But we'll have to yeah. hang on a little bit longer. I know I've been des out designing on a long weekend, and I and there's been snow. So this is not, you know, it's not every year, but it has happened before. So, uh, so yeah. Yes, and I keep thinking, remember, our, like, average last frost date is the May 2-4 weekend. So it, it's gotten that by reputation, and now Mother Nature's really showing us that reputation. That's yeah. why we're waiting till the May 2-4 weekend. Yeah. This now, we call it the May, I do want to say, ask about that, because we call it the May 2-4 weekend, but this, but because it moves around, this year, this year it's a little early, and the May 24th is the following weekend. So I think we should still stay close, you know, stay close to the 20, you know, 20th, 21st, 20, you know, in there. Don't you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just don't go by the long weekend so much as the actual date of that. Of the 24. Yeah, sort of the 20 to the 24. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. agree. Good, yeah. good. All right. So tropicals, I do want to talk a bit more about those. Um, you know, they, I think a little bit of a heavy feeder, but I think all anything we put in a container is going to be a heavy feeder, right? Yeah, yeah. They're all going to be consistent contained they're going to have other plants with them and they're all going to be competing so yeah, giving yeah, a little sure. bit of extra food just to keep up with that competition yeah okay for sure okay and i think people um you know at many other annuals people think of color but sometimes less is more so i think simple things like the boston fern is always super positive uh, yeah. and it just looks classic um the um foxtail fern the asparagus ferns like you can do some really nice just you know especially if you had a cool funky pot or like a like a, let's say a really dramatic black pot and then just a simple bright green, you know, you got to love that color of those, those things, those tropical plants. So that is yeah. something to think about, right? It isn't, it doesn't have to be orange and pink and, and red, you know, it can be, um, they can look great in, uh, in some really nice spots and really add that nice contrast. And especially in the shade, right? Because some of those um, those ferns, some of those tropicals, even though we think that they want all a ton of sun, they actually don't want as much uh, as we think they do. And they are better in a, in a part part sun location versus a you know a southern or western facing uh, really really hot. Um, so when you get into the foxtail ferns and that type of thing in Boston, the Boston fern will grow, I think, even north facing, right? With very little light. It'll last you yeah. the season. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All the tropicals you go by, they were, they weren't grown in direct sun. They were grown under shade cloth. Yeah. Right. Exactly. We've got like five minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> one, did you have anything to add before I throw maybe one more out there? Uh, no, no, I mean, we didn't even get to talk about perennials, but uh, yeah, you go ahead. You go, what are you going to talk about? So just leading into like what you were just saying, perennials, you said not the big grasses, but the cooler season, shorter grasses, like the carexes and the Japanese forest grass or the blue fescues make nice little additions uh, ah. texturally and color-wise popped in and around them. Yeah. One of the things that I'm looking forward to trying this year uh, out on the balcony uh, is a water garden in a container Ooh, and okay. you can definitely do that if you've got electricity it works a little bit better just because you get the water movement um, and now even right we don't want the mosquitoes uh, right. depending where you are so just agitating uh, the water but you can usually get some solar things to agitate the water but there's a lot of great shallow water tropical plants or, or water plants sorry uh, and some hardy ones too uh, that may not overwinter in your container, 
but that you can put out on your balcony for a little bit of water and, and, uh, or your balcony or out into your yard in a large water bowl that can add another little dimension. And maybe you don't have enough for a pond, uh, but a nice, you know, 24 inch water bowl can add you that trickling water or uh, some small fish or some sort of water pond life. Uh, oh. And they can complement another grouping of containers. I think that's a whole show on its own, Matt. I think so. <laughs> but we are talking about gar gardening beyond the basics. So those are some more advanced things for sure. Yes. Um, you know, I think coral bells and, um, mm. and hostas are still great additions to, um, to planters also so thinking about those and i know i've done um i loved little lime when it first came out and i yeah. was able to so the other cool thing you can do is you can if you are worried about the plant overwintering you can leave it in its pot put it in your container add you know your other things around it but come fall you know find a uh, like a you know an empty space or gap in your garden and dig a hole and then take take the garden pot of the limelight hydrangea or the little lime hydrangea and put it in the in the garden for the winter so that is something that you know you can do that with perennials and shrubs um if you are worried or um let's say you're in a, an apartment but your mom might have space in her garden so then you can take uh, take it over there or a friend or something like that has space in their garden where you can overwinter that plant in the in the ground um, so I have one of my one of my little limes that is in my garden now that I did do that with for three years I had it in my front um, urn um, for a number of years and then I just kind of got tired of doing that so it stays and when I overwintered it that I just planted it so it's in my garden and it's still there and still growing um, and uh, and now in the last couple of years I've been having fun with house plants and tropicals and uh, and uh, yeah so I think that's and I love the idea of trying to bring them in the house and trying to keep them alive even if I can get one season out of them I, I think that feels You've cut out totally there. Did I cut out? Okay. Yeah, How am oh, I there back? You go. You're back. Okay. <laughs> I'm back. Um, sorry, that appeals to me to do that uh so yeah so again i can't believe how fast it's, every time we get a great topic well every week we seem to have a great topic uh the show flies by so we thank everybody i hope you enjoyed it what did you think matt anything else you want to share no i you know what go out be daring try different combinations don't be afraid to try some smaller shrubs or some standard shrubs, your favorite perennials, something that just catches your eye and mix them into your usual, you know, annuals and ivies and whatever you normally put in your containers. Try yes, and then picture. send us a picture. So we'd exactly. love you to send us a picture. You can email us at instudio101 at gmail.com, right, Gary? Um, <laughs> so, um, That's right. Or you can uh, share them on our Facebook page at Down the Garden Path Podcast uh, in our fa Facebook page. Uh, yep. Or even tag us, or, like, if you're going to share them on your Instagram, then you can even tag us uh, on Instagram at Down the, Par Down the Garden Path Podcast um, on Instagram. You can tag us, and we would love to see what you've come up with. Exactly, exactly. And we'll share our containers this year too and see what you guys think that's right that's right so uh, we hope we learned some things and we hope we got we we gave you some great ideas to kind of get out of your comfort zone that's right so thank you alice chris daredevil erica greg thank you to all our listeners for tuning in this week uh to down the garden path we will be next week uh back with a brand new subject uh, don't forget to follow us at Down the Garden Path Podcast on all your social media. Uh, and thank you, Joanne, for joining us tonight. For uh, me, as always. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, yeah, and check out past shows for anybody who's listening late in the show. You know, past shows are on uh, your favorite podcast app of Down the Garden Path Podcast. And thank you for joining us live on Reality Radio 101. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101.